So welcome everybody. Uh, more people are joining, uh, but it's 9.01 uh, and uh, we are going to start panel one soon. Uh, no, not, not panel one, uh, plenary panel. <laughs> Before that, then, and I'd like to uh, share our story with you uh, and thank some people. And then uh, I am, as a moderator of a plenary uh, panel, I am going to introduce my speakers uh, for today's session. So, welcome to Artworks, Teaching, Labor and Capitalism and Art and Design. Um, it was, uh, so it's just such a beautiful day, uh, but I am uh, thankful that everybody is here <laughs> in front of your monitor. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Kyung Pyeon. I'm a co-host of this symposium with Dan Livingston Wilk as professors at FIT. Dan teaches American history in the Department of Social Sciences, and I teach art history in the Department of History of Art. This symposium, Artworks, Teaching Labor and Capitalism and Art and Design, um, is a component of our three-year research project called Teaching Business and Labor History to Art and Design Students. FIT received its first grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities in 2018. The project had three goals. So first, we wanted to gather, create, and use curricular materials to teach art and design students the history of business and work in the fields that they are entering. Second, we wanted to encourage the academic study of these rather neglected fields, both by our students and by professional scholars. Third, we wanted to publicize and share with others the curricular materials and academic studies we developed in webinars on our website and in two capstone conferences and an edited volume that drew from the faculty seminars. It was the first semester of 2017 when Dan and I wrote our proposal to get funding to pursue these goals. Now we have created a website called businesshistory.fitnyc.edu to showcase resources collected by our faculty seminars that spanned from 2018 to 2020. We met twice each semester and another twice during the winter and summer break. Just to refresh our memory with some initial thoughts that we had. This project sought to create curriculum for art and design students in community college programs that will educate them on the history of working as an artist or designer, how the roles of designing and making became separated, how new technologies and the rise of mass production affected our creative careers, the shift back and forth between direct employment and freelancing, the evolution of government interventions in creative fields. So there are more uh, questions. This additional education will better prepare our students for the world of work that they chose. By teaching students how art and design were done or created differently in different eras, it will also empower them to imagine and create better, more profitable, and more enjoyable ways to structure their careers and industries. Artists and designers aspire to be creative geniuses, and they often are, but they are also uh, bosses, employees, members of professional associations, and citizens of nations that encourage and restrain their creative work in various ways. Art and design students are generally not taught the intricacies of these other roles, how to navigate them, or how to change them. Young artists and designers face a sometimes cruel or indifferent world. How do we prepare art and design students for careers in this capitalist marketplace? Back in April of 2019, we had our first symposium called Artist Designers realities and imaginations in labor and business history. Many panelists here today and tomorrow also participated in the first symposium. Some of the themes in this year's symposium are chosen based on suggestions and heated debates from the first symposium. 
For the past two years, the entire world was affected by many, many catastrophic events, including the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, these affairs put tremendous impact on artists and designers as well. Thus, we will discuss such questions as art and design in an age of a catastrophe, internships, nationalism and cultural appropriation, teaching about labor unions and collectives, and how to learn from art and design racial crisis. Panelists include artists, designers, faculty from FIT, uh, Parsons School of Design, the School of Art Institute of Chicago, Fordham University, City University of New York, Princeton University, Harvard University, uh, Penn State, and Ryerson University in Canada. Both Dan and I are thankful for those who uh, accepted our invitation, generously shared their time with us in preliminary sessions via emails or virtual meetings. Our Vice President, Jack Oliva, and the Academic Affairs of FIT were enthusiastically supportive of this symposium, as well as our three-year-long journey. Other offices within the Academic Affairs also contributed much to the successful outcome of faculty seminars. Reference librarians at the Gladys Marcus Library were phenomenal in setting up a library research guide and in finding references. Center for Excellence in Teaching was pivotal in disseminating our findings to the faculty and in, in allocating faculty development and research grants for our members to attend conferences. Other schools within FIT were also collegial in promoting various events and in recommending faculty fellows for our seminars. Most importantly, we'd like to thank uh, Dean Patrick Nicely of the School of Liberal Arts. Patrick's office and staff members were indispensable in conducting a post award grant management. I hope Mary Chizimoto, uh, assistant to Dean Patrick Nicely, is listening to me this morning. Thank you, Mary, so much. <laughs> Dan and I are tremendously fortunate to have a talented, thoughtful, and enormously collegial uh, colleagues at FIT. We have had about eight to 10 faculty fellows uh, whom we have met regularly over three years. Drawn from all the schools, schools of business and technology, school of art and design, school of liberal arts and school of graduate studies, these professors uh, were eager to learn something new, business and labor history for art and design. Wealth of professional knowledge and lived experiences of these industry professionals was profound and compelling. Stories from their emerging years as designers, artists, managers were heartbreaking and, and yet aspiring. The feeling of urgency, passion, solidarity, and integrity is also what we all discover in our students. This is why we all participated in, in this journey. Thank you so much for those of you who spent numerous evening hours sharing candidly and reaching out to us. Finally, we thank our student assistant, Robin Lynch of Fashion Business Management and India Adolfson of Visual Presentation and Exhibition Design. We also have other students monitors today and tomorrow, and we will thank them on the second day. Without further ado, we will share some notes on the format of the symposium. Each panel is one hour long. This is always held in the main room where you are right now uh, in your program. A panel is followed by a breakout session for networking and further discussion. We will be announcing who's doing what in which room at the end of each panel and inviting the audience to plan conversations for different breakout rooms too. This is an uh, intimate opportunity to meet and talk to panelists and fellow uh, and other fellow uh, audiences. So now um, Ben has something to say. Hi everybody. I just wanted to add my thank you to everybody who Kyungi mentioned and also to all of you for being here. Just a couple of other logistical notes. Uh, one, some of the programs that were sent out earlier had a couple of links that didn't work on them. But it's not a problem because all of our panels are in the same room. So you can click on any of the links for day one to get into any day one panel, any of the other links for day two to get into the day two panel. 
or just keep this link open all day and here we'll be. Um, I also wanted to mention that we are not allowing our, per, uh, our guests to speak out loud during panels. We hope that you will all have questions for the panelists, but we ask that you write them in the chat box and we will have our student aides or maybe even me sometimes read them aloud. Um, I'm going to say again what Ken he said about breakout rooms that we have breakout rooms for the sessions in between. And at the ends of panels, we're going to be asking people, is there any particular topic you'd like to discuss with other people in a breakout room? And we will assign some of them to specific topics to let you go and chat. Um, and I also wanted to mention that from 1 to 2 p.m. today, uh, the union at FIT, the United College Employees, is holding an event called Stop Asian Hate. And I've gotten permission to invite all of you to join for the first half hour if you're interested in that. But then you have to come back to our panel because our panel overlaps a little bit with their event. Um, so thank you all very much for being here. And I guess it's time to start our first plenary. Thank you, Dan. Um, so I am the one who is going to be a moderator of the first uh, morning plenary session. And I want to briefly share uh, my cover slide. Uh, so uh, this is a uh, state of research of business and labor history to art and design curriculum. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, again, this is Kyung Hee Chan, uh, co-host of this symposium. Uh, I'm professor of art history. It's a great pleasure to open this symposium with the scholars who spent the entire career on that on the study of business and labor history. Two panelists, Professor uh, Joshua Freeman and Professor uh, Kirsten Swint, had come to the 2019 symposium held at FIT. It is an honor to invite them back. Um, originally, we had a panelist, uh, Yuna Lee, listed, um, and she uh, has a family emergency. So, unfortunately, she cannot join us today. So, I brought Dan here <laughs> as a panelist. So uh, let me start by introducing um, two of our eminent panelists. Professor Joshua Freeman is a historian and distinguished professor at the City University of New York Graduate Center. He has written extensively about the history of labor, modern America, and New York City. His books include Beermouth, A History of the Factory and the Making of the Modern World. Another book, Working Class New York, Life and Labor Since World War II. And third book, American Empire, The Rise of a Global Power, The Democratic Revolution at Home. And I haven't read this, I really want to read this. It's called In Transit, The Transport Workers Union in New York City, 1933 to 1966. Um, thank you, Josh, for coming again. Uh, and I'm going to read uh, Kirsten Swin's bio. Um, so, uh, Professor Swint teaches history at Fordham University. Her research interests are U.S. women's and gender history, post-World War II, uh, U.S. social, cultural, economic history, visual culture, popular culture, and American studies in general. Professor Swint is the author of Feminism's Forgotten Fight, The Unfinished Struggle for Work and Family, and another book, Professionals. Women Artists and the Development of Modern American Art, 1870 to 1930. So the format of this panel is to ask a question to all the panelists and each panelist will speak about five to seven minutes on the topic by taking turns. Audiences are welcome to type questions or comments in the chat box. Then I'm going to feed those questions back to the panelists. So let me stop sharing uh, my slide so that you can have a full view of uh, speakers and the audiences together. Um, so um, are you ready, <laughs> my panelists? <laughs> yeah, so um, the first question that we want to discuss is, do you have any update on the state of research of a business and labor history to art and design students since April 2019? It has been two, three years. Hmm. So Josh, do you want to go first? 
Sure. Um, first of all, Kanye and, and Dan and everybody, thank you for having me back. Um, it was great uh, two years ago, and it's great to be here again. Um, you know, I'm a labor historian. I don't particularly focus on art and design, and, and I haven't seen a wealth of new studies specifically on this. But, you know, what I, I want to briefly talk about is how I think this issue arises broadly, and, 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 and there are kind of various entry points to it. So two books I want to mention that I read, uh, not expecting to take me in this direction that they did. Uh, one was the catalog to the Jacob Lawrence show at uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And this was a show of his series of paintings called American Struggle. Uh, and unfortunately, it happened during the pandemic, so a lot of people didn't get to see it, but it, it's a fantastic show. And it's a terrific catalog, and, but why do I bring it up? You know, here's a famous artist, and you read this catalog, and you uh, stumble on the obstacles of the mid-20th century to a uh, 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 an artist getting his work out there. And in fact, this series was a failure. Um, he uh, was unable to sell it as a series, as his more famous earlier series has been sold. It was broken up. In fact, two of the paintings in it were bought at flea markets on the Upper West Side and only recently discovered. Um, so here you see in, in, in some of the catalog essays, you know, what's the structure of the art world? What's the business structure? And now we're talking, of course, at the very high end, you know, and even at the high end, you see, at least in my view, how threaded through it is race, you know, and, and, and here's a uh, a guy that we think of as one of the leading 20th century American artists, and yet he can't sell his paintings, you know, uh, in the height of the booming, you know, post-war New York is the center of the world art market. So that was a fascinating book. Um, another book, which seems to have absolutely nothing to do with this, it was a book by a guy named Ryan Pettengill called Communists and Community, Activism in Detroit's Labor Movement, 1941 to 1956. Well, what does this have to do with art? Um, well, one of the people he talks about is a fashion designer named Elizabeth Hawes, who spent World War II in Detroit. And I don't know if people know anything about her, but she's a fascinating figure. She started out uh, a traditional career, uh, doing knockoffs of couture in, in Paris, uh, started her own uh, fashion business in New York, uh, became a big critic of the structure of the fashion business, and then during World War II, she, she closed her business, went to work in a uh, airplane factory. You know, uh, she thought she had to, you know, uh, participate in the war effort, became a columnist, uh, and eventually worked for the United Automobile Workers and wrote a column in the Detroit News. And, and that, this book situates her in the sort of politics of World War II. So it looks at her during this interlude in her career and then at the end of the war, she goes back to New York, tries to reestablish her fashion business, and basically fails. And, and you know, it's a fascinating uh, career that shows both the possibilities and the obstacles to doing things so differently. So those were two books that really struck me. Um, the other thing I would just briefly mention is I think there's some books that have come out that would be terrific for the broad context for art and design students, you know, very accessible broad histories. Um, one I would mention is Steve Greenhouse's book. He was the longtime New York Times labor reporter. He published a book called Beaten Down, Worked Up, The Past and Present of the Future of American Labor. Very accessible look at the past and present of American labor. Uh, the other book is by Joe Trotter. It's called Workers on Arrival, Black Labor in the Making of America. And I think it's the best uh, single volume look at the history of black workers and black work in the United States. Both of them terrific students. And then one final thing I would mention is, you know, in the two years since we last met, the, uh, there's been an enormous amount of scholarship on what's come to be called racial capitalism. And again, you know, this is a broad context for thinking about any career, any industry. And uh, there are many things out there, but uh, for teaching purposes, uh, you could, do very well to start with the New York Times Magazine uh, 1619 special issue. Very controversial, but very provocative and very useful. Hey, so, how's it going? So, yeah, you know, that that that's where I would uh, point to it. So thank so, you uh, so much, uh, Kirsten. Yes, go ahead. 
Um, so, Joshua, I was exactly going to say that about racial capitalism. That was uh, my lead here was to begin to talk about, I think, that one of the most flourishing dynamic fields in um, kind of labor history and the well, history of capitalism more broadly construed is the, the histories of racial capitalism that are emerging. And I agree that the 1619 project and some of the scholarly debates that have surfaced around the 1619 project, which you know you can find easily enough by looking online, um, are, re are really interesting and informative and um, uh, also, the, the kind of controversy around that project continues to help us as scholars and help students think about how debates about um, kind of race in particular um, ha inflect our understanding of the histories of capitalism. You know, I, in all honesty, my, I, my sense is that um, more specifically in the areas where I have expertise, I don't have a lot of big updates. Um, I have more thoughts on Kyung Yi's next question. So maybe we want to like pass the, 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 the baton over to Dan in case he has something to say. And then I have a lot to say about thoughts about studying business and labor history in the aftermath of COVID. Sure, thanks. Um, so I want to third the seconding of the discussion of racial capitalism, which I think has been really exciting. And I, I actually, my area is the history of the service sector. Um, and there have been so many great works coming out. I've got a book about uh, people who were franchising McDonald's and also fighting for civil rights on my bookshelf that I haven't read yet and a whole bunch of other things. Um, I don't know of much within this growth of racial capitalism debate that's specifically about art and design, though. Um, and I hope that there will be more of that. On the other hand, I have seen a huge growth of interest in, on the business end in particular, uh, in fashion design and art and design business history. And Kenki and I have been sort of making the rounds of different conferences over the last couple of years. It seems like all of a sudden, uh, we went to one in Oslo. We went to one in Rotterdam. Uh, Ken, he went to one without me in England. People are, are getting interested, I think, both within the business history world, getting interested in art and design, and within the scholarly world of art and design, getting more interested in business and maybe a little bit in labor. But what I haven't seen in any of these conferences or this sort of recent efflorescence of work is a through line, a central question a theory, um, whereas, you know, the field of racial capitalism, I think it's pretty clear what people are getting at. Uh, I don't think that we figured out what we're getting at yet when we are trying to talk about business and labor and art and design. Um, and Kyung Hee and I have even had some conversations about how you periodize the history of this. Would you follow a, you know, general periodization that you would give to capitalism in general. You would talk maybe about the era of merchant capitalism, the era of industrial capitalism and post-industrial capitalism. Do changes in labor and business practices in art and design map onto that chronology? We don't know yet. Um, I think there's still a lot more work to be done. And so it's an exciting time to be thinking about these things. Yeah, thank you uh, for um, sharing uh, your readings for the past two years or even three years. Um, so uh, now let's move on to the next uh, question. So um, can you uh, point out uh, or emphasize the significance of studying and studying business and labor history in the aftermath of COVID-19? Not necessarily art and design, but you know, in general, uh, why studying uh, business and labor history is so crucial um, you know, in, in, um, in this uh, aftermath of the pandemic. Kirsten, you want, do you want to go first this time? Sure. Um, so, um, I think there are a lot of ways that the pandemic has highlighted the centrality of studying capitalism. Um, broadly construed um, capitalism in terms of the history of business and capitalism in terms of labor history. First of all, the pandemic has uh, been a crisis of capitalism and it has exacerbated a variety of other crises within contemporary capitalism, notably the care crisis that we often talk about. So I think that as a crisis moment, it invites us to look back at other moments of crises and the ways that they've triggered and stimulated um, a range of responses that um, 
you know, I'm th that have been to the benefit of ordinary people who have been the victims of the crisis. So I'm thinking, for example, of the New Deal and the ways that the crisis of capitalism around the New Deal in the 1930s triggered a host of um, both direct uh, job oriented supports, particularly for those working in the arts, um, but also the birth of a modern social welfare state. And here we have a moment where our modern social welfare state is absolutely clearly in need of massive um, infusions of support and updating. Um, I think that COVID-19 has highlighted the brutal realities of wage inequality and the ways that the uber rich have gotten richer and richer while um, frontline essential workers um, who are struggling in uh, with low wages have gotten uh, have suffered uh, disproportionately particularly when those workers are workers of color so i think there's a new um energy and motivation to study uh, wage inequality, the forces behind wage inequality, and the kinds of state policies that will help redress wage inequality. But for me, from my area of study, um, the biggest um, import for the COVID-19 pandemic has been in the histories of um, care work, social reproduction, and domestic labor. And there's been, I think, in the last five to seven years, a real flourishing in the study and history of social reproduction. So we have some recent collections added by Tithi Bhattacharya on theorizing social reproduction. We have the economist Nancy Fulbray's new New book um, coming out on social reproduction. I'll put a plug in for some work that I'm doing with Fordham's um, initiative in the global history of capitalism. We had a panel this February on the history of social reproduction, but we'll be doing a day long conference next year in spring 2021. So anyone who's interested in the histories of social reproduction, feel free to pop me an email or um, and I'll make sure you get on our mailing list. Um, the histories of social reproduction are really important because on the one hand, it's a matter of theorizing the significance and impact of the unpaid labor. Sometimes it's actually paid labor that reproduces the humans and the social networks that um, uh, facilitate or enable workers to go to their jobs. And sometimes we're talking here about unpaid care work, and that's obviously been visible during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I can talk more about that a little bit later on when we talk about um, you know, some of the impacts in the gendered sense. Um, but we're also talking about paid workers. So some of the most vulnerable workers during the COVID-19 pandemic were like home health aid workers, nursing home aides, people who were overwhelmingly female, overwhelmingly women of color who were paid at outrageously low wages. And those are in long, long, long histories of um, inadequate pay for domestic and care workers. So here, for example, um, historically, I think of the brilliant work of Premalin Adassin on domestic workers. I think of Eileen Boris's and Jennifer Klein's book on the histories of um, organizing by care workers. Um, those are good starting points for thinking about that. Um, and anyone who's really into this question should check out the Wages for Housework movement. The Wages for Housework movement is a Marxist feminist movement that um, has been around since the 1970s, which essentially tried to use Marxist thinking to um, to analyze the kind of economic import within capitalism of social reproduction. So some of you will have seen the, um, the profile of Silvia Federici in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. So you know an issue has come home to roost when someone gets a glowing pro profile in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. Uh, she's one of the founders of the Wages for Housework movement. There's wonderful graphic artwork in that book. I think can you just put the link to that book. That's fantastic. So for those of you who are interested in art and design, there's an incredible amount of crea artistic creativity in the promotion of the Wages for Housework movement. Um, so uh, I'll stop there. I can, I'm happy to circle back around to this as we move on to some of our other questions too. Uh, maybe I'll pick up. There's a, a lot of overlap to where I was thinking about this myself. You know, I mean, in some ways, I think we've lived through a very 
unprecedented situation in the in the last year, but not not completely unprecedented. And obviously, there've been both pandemics and economic crises in the past. And I think it is useful to look back. And I very much agree with Kirsten. You know, uh, my mind goes back to. Uh, the New Deal, which you know is a response to a, a different economic crisis, I think a very different economic crisis in some ways, but 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 nonetheless, a, a crisis that saw so many of the problems we've seen in the last year, you know, massive unemployment um, and, and marginality for so many people. And I think it's very uh, more useful than ever before to think about the responses to that situation and how they are interesting in themselves, but also are suggestive for our current situation. And, you know, um, first to mention, you know, obviously the increase in state activity uh, in, in the New Deal, which included the di direct employment, and of course, very famously, a great deal of direct employment of artists, you know, and these included, you know, household names, Ben Shaw and Jackson Pollock, you know, you name it, but also lots and lots of, you know, uh, uh, journeymen, designers, and artists of, of all kinds in, in, in um, not only producing artwork, but also in a tremendous increase in art education, uh, which was uh, directly government funded. And there's been a lot of scholarship on this, and this is you know, pretty well known, and people know about the post office murals and so forth. A little less known was a reprise of this in the 1970s when there was a big economic crisis, and uh, the federal government create something called the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act. And this was really the last time the federal government uh, got was in the business of directly employing unemployed people. But again, what's interesting is here in New York City, there was a CETA, that's what this program was known as, program for artists. And there was a kind of flourishing, a brief year or so, uh, of government employment of artists. So. Uh, this was an interesting response. Now, uh, there's been some support for artists and designers in the recovery bills, um, kind of not targeted or not so obviously specific to them in the way these previous programs were. But it, that's certain, certainly worth looking at. Um, I think uh, uh, the, the accompaniment to this was the spread of self-organization, you know, the development of different kinds of entities by artists and designers, and of course, and people in every other field and industry too, uh, to uh, protect and advocate for their interests. Uh, labor unionism was the most obvious, you know, uh, example, and I guess the most important example of this. And you saw some of this uh, people in design fields. For example, there was an architects union that developed during the uh, New Deal um, and continues in, in the public sector mostly to this day. Um, but there were other kinds of groups that were were were, were, were sort of uh, advocacy organizations of various kinds. Um, and you know, today we, 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 you know, in some ways we have different challenges because the structure of the industry is different with the spread of freelancing and gig work. But you know, there is a lot of scholarship now emerging on new forms of labor organization. You know, we're sometimes called worker centers, which are non-collective bargaining advocacy groups. Many of them work with undocumented, but uh, another very important example of this is the Freelancers Union, which uh, has many artists and designers uh, involved. So, you know, uh, we're seeing echoes today, but of course things are never exactly the same as they were in, in, in the past. Um, let me just mention one other area, which I think deserves some study and some thought. Um, uh, again, looking to past crises, you know, one thing that has struck me is the minimal role of artists and designers uh, being mobilized to deal with the current crisis, economic, but also public health crisis, compared to the past. You know, if you think about World War I, or you think about the New Deal, or you think about World War II, there were such uh, uh, iconic images created by artists and designers. Uh, propaganda, which I, you know, which is not just a negative word, you know, to promote the war effort, to sell war bonds, to get people to save metal, to uh, keep their lips sealed and not disclose secrets, um, to support the New Deal, whatever it might be. And again, there were people like Ben Chorn, very famous artists involved in this, but also lots of people that, whose names may not be known. I can't think of a single iconic image having to do with COVID-19, you know, and that seems to me a real historical shift 
seems to me it must reflect something in the positioning of the art and design fields compared to where they once were. And that's as far as I've gotten. So I want some really smart young historian um, to take this project on. That's really interesting. Uh, it had not occurred to me. And, you know, I'm thinking even back to the Obama campaign in which I think that they were really striking graphic images, but nothing this year. Um, one other thing that I would add, uh, which I also think there hasn't been much research on, is the geography of creative work, and in particular, the geography of collaboration in creative work. That the isolation of the pandemic has led us to collaborate in all sorts of new ways, um, maybe accelerating in some ways the growing isolation of artists and designers that began as freelancing became more and more popular. Um, and I wonder what the long term effects are going to be. Are we going to be um, working on our own as artistic geniuses more often than working in rooms with other people? Um, is that going to become the new normal or not? And what has been the shifts in this geography? So I'm thinking about, you know, lots of work on the geography of garment manufacturing. And whether it's better to make a garment in a factory or spread out manufacturing all over the Lower East Side. But I don't know of work that discusses the geography of creative art in the same way. Um, and I think that COVID really focused me on that absence in the literature. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, you know, it's already 940 ish. So, uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, type in in the chat. Uh, so uh, let's move on to uh, the next question. Some of you already mentioned racial capitalism, but a lot of people obviously very much affected by the Black Lives Matter and presidential election this, you know, last year and insurrection uh, of the Capitol Hill. So would you like to share your thoughts on the relevance of studying uh, business and labor history in this context? The more, I mean, you, you touched upon racial capitalism, but more into um, the racial ethnic dynamics of the United States now. Uh, but let, let me let me just I'll, I'll start, you know, and, and, and just say a couple things, you know, I mean, look, the Black Lives Matter movement, I think in some ways changed everything in some ways changed nothing. You know, I mean, obviously, uh, it's a hugely important political and social movement. Um, I think for many scholars, you know, it's not like uh, the issues that this movement has addressed have been unknown, you know, I mean, uh, and frankly, it's taken a kind of willful blindness for a lot of American society to avoid uh, the kinds of uh, understandings of the past that, that have now become more current uh, in, in, in the light of this. And, and obviously it's had a big institutional impact Sort of, you know, I mean, every museum and every corporation and every university is now apologized and committed themselves to being good and stopping bad and so forth and so on, you know. Um, uh, but I think, you know, um, it really does create some opportunities for us to go a little beyond that. And, and I think that the university world has provided a good model in some ways, which is that a number of the universities, you know, most famously maybe Georgetown over the last 10 years, have commissioned studies, usually by their own faculty and students, or sometimes they've been uh, confronted with studies that their faculty and students have taken on, on their own part, to look at the history of these particular institutions, to get away from these general broad statements about American life, and let's look at this museum or this institution. And of course, you know, they, they've looked at the history of slavery and, and the involvement of uh, slave owners and money made in slavery in some of the leading institutions of American life uh, and, and the post-slavery hist hist history of, of racism and racial relations uh, in these institutions. And in a few cases, you know, again, Georgetown, I think has been one of the models of this. These have actually been the basis for institutional action uh, to attempt to address, to remedy or rectify or uh, repair um, this history. And I think this is a, a good model for, you know, other institutions. I mean, museums, uh, 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 foundations that issue grants, you know, um, corporations, you know, uh, uh, in other words, all the structures within which art and design takes place, you know, 
and I think, you know, uh, this is an opportunity to, to, to seriously look at the specific history of these institutions and use that history, you know, as a basis for the very difficult uh, challenge, but necessary challenge of, of thinking about how we move forward in a more equitable manner. So I think, you know, uh, it would be a great shame if, you know, things, oh, you know, sort of die down for the moment and everyone thinks, oh, you know, okay, you know, we, we issued our statement and we diversified our board a little bit and now it's all okay. Because it won't be all okay, and these issues will re-arise. So now I think is the time for us to do some some really hard thinking about all this. I love that connection, Josh. It's not one I would have made, but it, I think it's so brilliant, and um, I think really, really important. I actually went to like a slightly different angle in my thinking. Was I was just thinking like. Everybody has to study labor history now, because if anything, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is teaching us about the ways that structural racism works is it takes us always, always, always back to labor and always, always, always back to capitalism, because we understand how um, so many of those inequalities have been baked into the labor market, baked into the state structures, which reinforced inequalities in the labor market. Um, and so it seems to me, I, every time I, I've been reading all kinds of things that I've read in new lights as a consequence of the Black Lives Matter movement, some of which are directly labor history related and some of which are just um, reteaching me the persistent history of um, particularly black resistance to police brutality. So I retaught W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction this fall, and there was police brutality front and center. I just taught a book on the Black Panther Party, and there was police brutality front and center. So I think inviting us more broadly to teach, um, to revisit some familiar texts and some, some familiar histories about racial inequality in the United States in general is an important consequence of the movement. Um, the only other thing I really want to highlight, which kind of echoes my theme for the day, is the ways that um, these are intersectional inequalities and that when you start asking about race and labor history in particular, and you move gender into the question, it's incredibly revelatory about why we have ended up with the kind of labor force we do, where so many women of color continue to fulfill fill low wage, low valued um, domestic work. So um, I think about, um, Again, Pramila Nadasan's book on domestic workers, but Mary Poovey's book on the origins of social security, which tell us about the deliberate exclusion of domestic workers from labor standards, domestic workers who are almost exclusively um, women of color and black <clears throat> for long histories. Um, I think about the work of Evelyn Nakano Glenn, who's a brilliant historical sociologist who wrote a book called Forced to Care, but also a wonderful set of articles on the intersectional, intersectional realities of domestic labor. And um, uh, I think this it's a 1992 signs article, um, something from servitude to forced work. I can't remember the exact title, but I, I highly recommend it. And her work is extremely illuminating for students. Um, yeah, I'll stop there because I want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, I'll just add that I think that the Black Lives Matter movement has really brought the issue of cultural appropriation to the fore. Uh, we're going to be talking more about that tomorrow at the symposium. Um, but I'll just say now that cultural appropriation is clearly a really, really important factor in the history of art and design in America. Um, and so it's a story that we need to go back to. Uh, not just talking about the history of African Americans and in particular creating so much of American culture, but also the history of how our understanding of cultural appropriation has changed over time, where the boundaries have been, where they're going. Uh, students are really, really interested in talking about that, um, even more so in the last year. Thanks. So now uh, we are moving to our uh, fourth question that is Kirsten's expertise. So, New York mm -hmm. Times and other media outlets reported that women of color were hardest hit by the pandemic, and FIT as an institution and art and design industry in general 
we have a large proportion of women as workforce. Uh, so uh, we, uh, you know, we'd like to hear your comments on gendered layoffs or gendered employment in sectors of art and design industry and beyond. Um, so uh, let's start with Kristin. Thanks. Um, so I, I actually went digging around and if someone has the statistics, I was trying to figure out exactly how the gendered layoffs have played out for people working in art and design fields. My suspicion is that one of the struggles here is that places that are more direct service oriented are places where more female art uh, art workers and designers work. I'm thinking, for example, people who work in community art programs, um, people who work in schools doing art instruction. I mean, art instruction is a long-standing lane for female employment in art and design. And that some of those sectors, some have been protected, um, although they've required hybrid adaptation, say if you're working for a public school district, but many of those art education programs have suffered dramatically and enormously. And my suspicion is that women in particular uh, in art and design have um, faced higher layoffs and higher losses of income. Um, more broadly construed, if you ask about COVID-19 and gender and all female workers, we know that um, this has been called a she session. It's one of the first recessions where there's greater layoffs of women than greater lay than of men, and that women of color in particular have been uh, the hardest hit. Um, the, the deepest, darkest month was December 2020 when um, women lost uh, massive numbers of jobs and all of them could be attributed to loss of jobs for Latina and Black and Asian women. Black women in December 2020 lost 154,000 jobs. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty dark time. Um, the reason for that lies in the concentration of women and women of color in particular in these low wage services service sector lanes, uh, hotel industries, retail, tourism, many of the baseline service industries like um, childcare, where childcare centers haven't yet opened up. We also know that um, because women and women of color in particular staff the frontline um, healthcare industries, like as home health aides or nursing home aides, they've been particularly vulnerable to labor exploitation during the COVID-19 pandemic, both of them in the form of um, ex extremely low wages that leave them unable to purchase health insurance for themselves, as well as lack of employer responsiveness. I, I read a story this morning about a woman, because she worked for a private contractor as a home health aide, even though the state paid for her job, her employment, they were, she was not eligible for any PPE or COVID testing. So we know that there have been systematic ways that women at the bottom end of the spectrum have been vulnerable to COVID-19. And then the last thing I'll mention is something that um, people are struggling with day in and day out, which is the, the school closures, the child care closures, and the disproportionate impact of baseline responsibilities for caring for children, disabled family members, elders in the in that context. And um, mother's employment has taken a particularly deep hit in this period in the, in the last year. And, and mothers and women in general were just gaining what they had gained back from the, the early 2000s recession. And some people think it's going to be a massive generational setback for women's position in the labor force, particularly mother's position in the labor force. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, I'm just going to add one thing very briefly to that. You know, there is a historical pattern in the United States and in many capitalist countries where jobs have been sort of coded, you know, male jobs, female jobs, black jobs, white jobs, and so forth. And in times of economic uh, downturn, distress, you often see a shifting of those lines where, you know, jobs that men didn't want, they thought it was beneath them or unattractive, whatever it might be, cultural or economic reasons, now suddenly they want, right? So in the economic downturn of the 70s, for example, you saw a big increase in the number of male nurses. You've seen these shifts in areas like uh, teaching and social work. Um, and, 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 uh, and of course, you've also seen it uh, racially where jobs, uh, uh, bellhops in the South were all black till the Great Depression. And then suddenly white people wanted them and they pushed out 
uh, black workers. So, um, you know, I, I don't think we've, you know, those those boundaries have become more porous in recent years because of law and struggle uh, against discrimination, but they certainly still exist. And I think it'll be interesting to see if when the dust all clears, we've seen sort of recoding of jobs uh, contributing to this uh, uh, unequal burden that women have faced during the during the COVID period. I wonder if that recoding of jobs will be seen in the composition of art and design school student classes. Um, here at FIT, we're eighty five percent female because most of the careers that we funnel people into have been coded as female. Um, I feel like I've seen a little bit of shifting of that uh, over the last decade, but I wonder whether it will happen, you know, even more so going forward. Um, we'll keep you posted on that. Thank you so much for in, in relation to this gender the labor issue. Uh, I'd like to tell tell everybody that FIT uh, now has a second NEH grant. Uh, it's called Shop Girls to Show Girls. Teaching resources on New York's working class for community college students, and we are uh, going to discuss that that exact issue that Josh just mentioned. Is that some of the jobs used to be women's jobs, right? But now, uh, with the gender uh, identity and uh, you know LGBTQ and more uh, inclusive uh, community uh, atmosphere, uh, these gendered uh, jobs are. Sort of obliterated. So while we are going to talk about the historical formulation of some careers uh, in the next three years, so um, Josh and Kirsten are certainly welcome <laughs> back if you want to be more engaged. Um, so anyhow, um, we are uh, you know we had our four uh, questions, and I'd like to hear uh, from the audiences like a comment or your anecdotes uh, that touch upon the issues that were mentioned by these experts. Um, so, uh, please uh, type your uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, you only have a seven minutes left <laughs> to have these panelists, but you can also go into the breakout rooms and actually have a little bit of a one on one uh, conversation. Um, so, uh, um, you know, my um, final uh, question for you, uh, you know, our panelists is. Uh, so, as a historians of working class people or workers in general, do you have any suggestions for art and design professionals uh, on how to get through this catastrophe? Um, it, you, it can be your personal or your scholarly opinions, uh, but uh, we all, uh, uh, you know, got affected uh, by a lot of um, events for the past couple of years. Um, so, um, any suggestions uh, for future? Professionals and also current professionals. Well, I'm a labor historian, so I'm going to say the obvious. I think act collectively. You know, don't mm -hmm. don't think, you know, you're alone, and don't think it's your fault. You know, uh, which is often the reaction that people have in, in hard times. Oh, I do, I'm doing something wrong. I just need to work harder. You know, uh, when it's a it's a social context. And I think joining together. And yeah, we've seen some of this in, in groups that you might not have expected. I'm not a great expert on this, but I noted that, for example, art handlers have unionized uh, in recent years. Um, uh, and there have been other, you know, groups, you know, we've seen a huge amount of unionization among uh, uh, online digital journalists, you know, um, certain sort of professional groups that might not have been 10 years ago looking towards collective solutions have turned that way. So I think that's something, you know, we could take a lot of different forms. Uh, doesn't have to be a traditional union, but I think that is something worth uh, exploring. There is one question from the audience, so I'm going to read it for you. So uh, this person uh, is wondering how might uh, you know these developments, uh, new labor history of art and design intersect with labor activism around the logistics and warehousing. I am struck uh, that the pandemic has amplified our reliance on online retail and distribution. Um, such as Amazon, is there any new research that bring uh, brings art and design into conversation with the exploitative exploitative regimes of distribution? Hmm. You mean in, in art and design? What was the? Can you just add the last end of the question here? <laughs> 
Uh, so is there any new research that brings art and design into conversation with the exploitative regimes of distribution? I mean, I think the thing that comes to mind for me is works that have been made in the last several years about fashion design and the supply chain. Um, and that, that exploitation happens at every step of the supply chain. Um, so there are books about manufacturing. There are books about environmental degradation due to clothing manufacturing, but also books, um, a, a book that was published in France. I can't remember the name of the author about how the working conditions of fashion designers are really oppressive. Um, and I think that some of those points in the supply chain, the oppression is more obvious than others. Um, that fashion designers don't always understand that they're being oppressed in the same way that factory workers do, maybe. Um, and maybe understanding what the labor conditions are at every step in that supply chain, including distribution, including sales, is really important for every person in that supply chain to understand, you know, that oppression is pretty constant throughout it. I, I would just add one thing, you know, I, I, I think vis-a-vis -vis Amazon in specific, and this came up a bit in New York when there was the abortive effort to build a, a second Amazon headquarters mm -hmm. in Long Island City. You know, uh, we have focused mostly on warehouse and delivery workers when we think about Amazon, but Amazon, of course, has a ton of everything else, including designers, you know, uh, web designers, package designers, logo designers, ad designers, um, and, you know, when Amazon was thinking about moving to New York, uh, some labor advocates were saying, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't think of these as separate areas. You know, maybe we should go back to the old industrial model and say, instead of just aiming at warehouse workers, we should aim at all Amazon workers. And well, I mean, maybe Amazon heard someone talking out loud about this and they so they you know, said enough of this and they, 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 they pulled the plug on that. But, you know, it is an interesting thing to think about. You know, there are a lot of companies that are Primarily, you know, warehouse distribution companies uh, uh, on massive scale, but they do have artists and designers, uh, among other professionals, working in those companies, and and maybe they should be seen as having some common interests and some overlaps and some possibilities uh, towards working together. Yeah. So, um, so someone shared a link. Um, there is an article. Um... Uh, in the uh, newspaper, the other side of a made in France, working conditions in Paris, small textile workshops, uh, or uh, we talk about this uh, product of, uh, what is it, origin, you know, country of origin. <laughs> it's not really made in uh, Italy anymore. Like <laughs> All of these exploitative uh, conditions of transnational labors in a way, right? Like they are physically in Italy, but they were brought to Italy in order to be made in Italy, those kind of things as well. Um, but anyhow, uh, we have only one minute left. Uh, any final words from the panelists? I was just thinking about your, your question about how, how to cope in the time of crisis. Um, and for some reason, I woke up this morning thinking of the Gorilla Girls um, and of their fantastic billboards. Um, for their the the artistic power to call out injustice, um, and it, I, I I think Josh is absolutely right that collective action, collectivist action, is at the heart of responding. But I think being getting mad and making art and doing design that exposes the sort of unfair, unjust, and deeply consequential effects of COVID-19 on the art and design community, on our country, um, strikes me as an, as an absolutely needed and potentially generative um, place to put energies, if not necessarily immediately money-making, but um, still um, a source of um, really, for the rest of us who are not artists and designers, urgently needed um, work. Uh, to help push forward change in society. Yeah, I would just add to that that economic downturns are a great time to make art. Um, there's an interview that Stutz Terkel did with Yip Harburg, who wrote Somewhere Over the Rainbow and also Brother, Can You Spare a Dime, about how during the Great Depression, when everybody else was losing their jobs, he was released from having to work in business. 
and turned to writing lyrics, which made his career and made his life a lot happier. Um, the economic downturn of the 1970s leads to, in New York, the creation of the two most important music genres of the late 20th century, punk and hip hop. Um, what's going to be the great art that's created out of this pandemic? Uh, we don't know yet, but I hope it is. So let me just say a couple of logistical things. Um, thank you for people who put in some comments and questions. We're hoping for more in the future. But also, now that our breakout sessions are beginning, um, one, if you want to talk about any particular books, I would urge you to go to the Chelsea Room. The Chelsea Room is going to be sort of our book room. And if anybody wants to talk about a book that they've written that they'd like to encourage other people to buy, that's a good room to go to. Um, I also would recommend or suggest that if anybody wants to meet with me in Midtown to talk about creating the iconic image for the COVID era, um, we don't have it, as Josh said. I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. So I'm going to show up there in the Midtown room in a few minutes. And in the future, if anybody wants to suggest a topic to be in any particular breakout room, feel free to put it in the chat um, and we'll announce it at the end of the panel. So thank you everybody for this first one and we'll be back in about half an hour. Thank you so much. Yes. And now time to go.